Hi guys, this is GSN1.com and I'm here with a handset called the Orange Dive 71. You may also know it as the ZTE Blade A506. It's branded orange, as you know the famous carrier from France has uh, offered an integrated version of the ZTE phone named Orange Dive 71. So the phone is priced at around $145. It's a low mid-range device that's quite good looking, has a glass panel at the back, one at the front, which makes it uh, a higher than average looker compared to the other handsets out there. Okay, so it's oriented more for the uh, young consumer on multimedia, Facebooking and other things like that. And it's also one of the few carrier branded phones we've been testing here at gsn1.com over the past years. So let's address the design. Glass panel at the front, glass at the back. And as far as we know, the one at the front is a 2.5D glass panel. We get a unibody design, so we're going to need a special metal key to access the slots from here. There's a metal frame here, but you wouldn't feel it because it's covered by plastic or some kind of similar material. The device feels like a toy because it's very light in the user's hand and uh, it weighs 133 grams while measuring 7.8 millimeters in thickness. Other than that, it's quite comfy to use even with a single hand as I'm doing right now. You can access basically all the areas with a single hand. Other than that, I have to say that the buttons on the side should protrude more, so they're not exactly comfy, especially the power one, they need to be out more so you can feel them with your hand better. The build of the phone is quite okay and those two glass panels are quite a bit of a fingerprint magnet. It's a comfy phone, it's good looking and it's actually one of the best looking phones on the market right now with 1GB of RAM if that's a landmark you care about. The grip is also quite good. Now we're talking about the display, as you can see it's quite bright. Uh, we get, let's say, mid-level bezels, so not too thick, not too slim. Once again, 2.5D glass panel at the front and the diagonal is 5.2 inches, while the resolution is 1280 over 720 pixels. The panel is an IPS LCD and since we have uh, no video player pre-installed, we may as well use the gallery application or you can opt for Google Photos, which is also pre-installed, but I'm going to gallery to show you our usual test video and uh, prove the behavior of said display. Okay, so video player, here we go. So we're dealing here with a bright screen, with a mediocre contrast in sunlight, vivid colors, wide view angles, but the image feels a bit too white for my taste and almost washed out. And now as far as the pixels are concerned, let's check those out under the microscope. These are RGB stripes pixels and we also did a test, a brightness test using the lux meter and we achieved 432 lux units which is great especially for the price tag we just mentioned before. It surpasses the Sony Xperia M5, the Asus Zenfone 2 Deluxe but scores just a bit below the Huawei P9 Lite and it's the exact equal of the LG G4 brightness. Of course the screen has special settings or well not so special or better said the regular settings display we got brightness level adaptive brightness touch key light duration wallpaper sleep daydream pulse notification light which is this one here and font size and that's about it so a solid screen even for the price tag maybe uh, minus the contrast and uh, um, the fact that the screen is a bit too white for my taste we continue with the hardware, this time we're talking about the CPU, the phone relies on a quad-core Qualcomm Snapdragon 200 processor, which is clocked at 1.3 GHz, and the GPU is of the Adreno 304 variety, there's also 1 GB of RAM here, 8 GB of storage, which run out very fast, you only get 4 GB to play with, and you take a few videos and photos, install a few games, and you're done. But thank god we have a micro SD card slot. So the phone. Uh, as you can see, it's not exactly very snappy, especially if you have some downloads running and you try to open an app, you'll find a bit of lag. Lag is present everywhere, in Dropbox, in app loading, in uploading and in loading games. Even a basic one like Leap Day takes quite a bit to load up. But the games in the end run ok after that loading period, including Riptide GP2, the famous benchmark racing game we usually test in our reviews. We also used it for a temperature test, which will be revealed in a minute now. 
here we go the race is loading let's turn down the volume a bit and here we go the graphics look quite nice the water is well rendered the controls are responsive and there is no stutter frame rate problem or anything like that so if you plan to do some casual gaming here you'll be happy to know that everything works out fine although loading times are not exactly optimal here and one gigabyte of ram is certainly not future proof now as far as the benchmarks are concerned we also ran those so let's see what's happening here okay so uh, we tried out for example quadrant and here we have a pretty small score as you can see we even score below the entry level phone sony xperia e4g so not exactly impressive while in other benchmarks like um, geekbench 3 we scored um, at around the 100th spot from all the phones we ever tested so that's not exactly impressive and in Antutu 6 we had a result that showed us the 3D section basically the GPU is quite underwhelming so not very impressive and not exactly the best CPU and GPU out there but still works decently now as far as the temperature is concerned after the benchmark GFX bench the temperature remained quite good 36.7 degrees celsius while uh, a run of uh, riptide gp2 the one from earlier uh, went to overheating with 42.2 degrees celsius so performance is pretty much sacrificed here as shown by the benchmarks there's also a bit of overheating as shown by the temperature so in the end you'll be happy only with casual games now the battery this phone hosts a lithium ion 2540 mAh battery non-removable and let's see how our test how our tests saw it okay so first we have a continuous video playback in a loop test with wi-fi on and brightness at uh, around 200 lux eight hours and five minutes which is quite okay it beats the huawei p9 Lite and asus zenfone 2 not bad but scores below the vernitor the real surprise was this one the pc mark work battery lifetime is huge seven hours and 41 minutes not bad at all it beats the samsung galaxy s6 and even the htc 10 so quite nice charging is a bit on the long side 2 hours and 50 minutes but for this price range it's quite okay it surpasses the iphone 6s plus but it's below the xiaomi uh, redmi note 3 pro of course there are settings to play with related to the battery you can find them here and battery nothing complex the usual battery saver which is pretty straightforward and battery optimization which has to do with uh, the dose feature from android marshmallow a good battery for the price actually an excellent one judging by the pc mark test now as far as the acoustics are concerned we have two grills here at the bottom flanking the micro usb port actually only the right one is the speaker this one is only for aesthetics purposes the music player that's pre-installed is google play music and interestingly the equalizer is different from the last time i saw it either google updated it or this phone comes with a custom equalizer here we are we got the usual options related to various genres you can activate it here you can tweak these five channels these are the options you get to play with user customized heavy metal hip-hop bass boost surround sound reverb small room big room etc and now it's time to actually listen to some tunes so here we go Okay, so conclusions, um, the volume is quite loud, clarity is also good, there is a decent bass here and it's actually not bad at all, um, it can cover one person speaking in a small room and there is no distortion, all of them good news. And I was surprised to see how the decibel meter caught the sound here with a very impressive result of 91.8 decibels, it's actually one of the highest measured ever by us it's top three it beats the galaxy s7 s6 and lg g5 so that's impressive now we also have a pair of headphones bundled with the device they're the kind of cheap ones you can find on every corner store in uh, basically every town in the world they're made of plastic 
somehow they're comfy in the ear, they have good isolation, decent bass, loud volume and okay clarity but they certainly are not good lookers as you can well see for yourself and the remote is frankly speaking horrible. Okay, putting that aside, once the headphones are inserted you can also access the FM radio app which also lets you record from the radio as shown here. Okay, so that's it in a nutshell, impressive acoustics, time to put this aside and see what the camera brings. So, nothing fancy on paper, 8 megapixel and LED flash, 5 megapixel and no LED flash. Okay, I'm going to close up some apps. Okay, making room for a better functioning and let's see how the camera app starts up. I would say a reasonable speed and the interface has been customized. It's not the stock one you'd expect on a Marshmallow phone, no sir, it's something different altogether. So, we got the front camera shortcut, timer, flash, HDR and options like picture size. There's also interpolation, so even though we have an 8 megapixel camera, you can take 30 megapixel shots, of course, by uh, uh, stitching together frames. Shutter sound, QR code, review, volume key control and video only goes up to 720p. There's also time lapse option and focus lock and that's about it on the left side of the UI. On the right side you can find filter scene with multiple modes and smile interval capture. This option here you can choose the interval, panorama and multi exposure. This one is actually one of the most interesting features. It lets you take a series of photos and blend them together in a darker shot, that's only one example, you can blend them in a brighter shot, you can use them as background, you can also create a collage and other features resulting from this multi exposure mode. There's also auto and manual and manual includes a guide, white balance, ISO and exposure and that's pretty much it. To film you can only press this button here and that's it. Now as far as the actual camera experience goes, the zoom is fluid enough. We have a pretty okay focus speed, taking into account that we are dealing with an 8 megapixel camera and a budget phone and picture taking speed is okay, but nothing more than that. Time to go to the gallery and see how this camera handled a day that mixed sun and clouds uh, at the start of August. Okay, so these are the shots and we start off with selfies, a bit on the blurry side and a bit washed out also unimpressive and then something that I noticed is that the pictures have a good texture however the HDR tends to make everything washed out and too white for example. Nice texture and details of flower close-ups so that's good but usually I found the images to be artificial looking so colors were not well calibrated or realistic but details and close-ups were quite good so just check out this sky not realistic at all, a bit artificial and over sharpened. Well, at least when you started zooming in, the details remained quite good. The colors also felt a bit cold in most pictures and one of the good news is that uh, we have very few blurred shots in this gallery. We also took a panorama with a resolution of 7046 over 592, not exactly impressive but at least it didn't have uh, any problem with curving or things like that. So we should find the panorama here, only slightly curved in this area but in the end pretty clear, well lit and not a bad resolution. I also noticed that the uh, quality of the shots in landscape mode is quite good, I mean the details are quite nice and in the shade things get even more clear or better said clearer so no objections here. We also tried the multi exposure thing and found it to be pretty much a gimmick, that's one example. Overlapping two pictures results in this or this or maybe this by splitting the screen. So in the end only a gimmick and the moment when the camera really shines is in a shadier area without too much sun and without too much shade. The balance is the perfect way to achieve good shots here, which we did and we also played with interpolation. 30 megapixel shots achieved by an 8 megapixel camera. In the end, I have to say that uh, I expected much less from this 8 megapixel shooter. It's good for 8 megapixels and good for the price, but it cannot fight a 13 megapixel shooter. It's about at the level of an iPhone 4S or maybe just a bit lower, so that's the proper comparison. Those are daytime shots. Now let's see the nighttime shots. These are low light captures. The first ones were not very impressive, were a bit fuzzy, the street lights were blurry, but as we progressed, 
we found the building's textures to be quite okay. Brightness is decent. The flash actually worked out fine. As you can see here, really influences the quality of the shot. There's lots of fuzz in the images, but in the end, I was happy with the quality, especially when the big street lights kick in. With proper lighting, you'll be happy with the results. Once again, considering this is a $145 phone. Okay, so it's time to also discuss the video here. You can only film in 720p, 29 frames per second, and 14 uh, mega per second bitrate. So I'm going to go ahead and find. This is the first video. Sadly, so sadly, the video is not on par with the photo capture. We got a microphone that uh, sounds echoey. We got a lot of refocusing, unrealistic colors, sudden exposure changes, poor colors, shaky image, and the poor rendering of the sky. It's very underwhelming, feels more like 480p than 720p, and things get even worse during nighttime filming, like this one here. It drops to 14 frames per second, zoom quality remains poor, and even for this price tag I've seen better filming, so only the photo aspect is to be considered on the Orange Dive 71. Ok, we're done with the camera, time to discuss the web browser, which in this case is the pre-installed Chrome, as you can see it doesn't start up very fast, and let's access gsndom.com, not the fastest in the world, actually quite slow. And its benchmark results confirm that, including Sun Spider. Now, as far as the virtual keyboard goes, you can see it's the stock one and it's pretty comfy. On the connectivity front, we're dealing with a phone that uses a single SIM setup and it offers 4G LT with up to 150 mega per second, Wi Fi BGN, Bluetooth 4.0, micro USB, there is GPS here, there is even NFC, and we rely on a nano SIM card slot for the calls. Speaking of calls, they're loud, clear, we have a good signal and good microphone. And we also did a speed test. Now let's see what came out of that. So this is the um, 4G speed test with a pretty good 78 mega per second in download and 43 in upload. The ping doesn't quite shine and I've seen much better than this on other phones, but in the end the result remains pretty good. Uh, as far as the Wi-Fi test goes, so that was the 4G, now we're looking for Wi-Fi. We got as high as 48 mega per second in download, 25 in upload, and I've seen much better than that, so Wi-Fi could be slightly better. Time to discuss the software. The Orange Dive 71 runs on Android 6.0.1 Marshmallow with some small tweaks. We got the stock icons, mostly. Multitasking is done via carousel. And if you keep the screen pressed, the home screen, you get wallpapers, widgets, and home screen settings. These are the widgets. Some of them are stock, some of them are from Orange, like those ones, battery and mobile data for example, and these are the special home screen settings like auto disable apps that are no longer in use or switch home screen, you can switch to the easy home screen where everything is right here for you, easy to access and simply comfy. Okay, then you can switch to standard if you want the standard experience and there are also a variety of gestures to apply, those here, so you draw a certain letter to access a certain application and you can add more from here. Now, we also have a stock notification area and quick settings area, stock for Marshmallow. And then we go to the settings area where once again, everything is just as expected. Connectivity settings, device settings, battery and memory options, user, security, accounts, date and time, and that's everything. As far as the pre-installed apps go, I counted them. There's 35 of them, not exactly bloater, but five less would have been excellent. So we got the assistant coming from Orange, with a bunch of uh, things here like choosing home screen, lock screen setup and removing apps. Then there's uh, Chrome of course, there's Deezer for music, some games from Gameloft. And um, let's see what else we got here, we got the WPS Office for productivity. And I have to mention that the UI is not fluid all the time, sadly. Now this is the end of the review and it's time for the pros and cons. On the pro side we have a nice design, a comfy phone, a bright screen, Okay, okay picture taking quality, pretty loud volume, actually very loud volume, quite a good battery and the clean software close to stock is a nice addition. On the con side there's a bit of lag, the CPU and GPU are a bit underwhelming, there's too little storage to have fun, 
poor video capture and once again modest CPU and GPU. In the end this remains a phone that's good looking for an entry level unit or entry level mid ranger so to say, $145 phone, good for multimedia consumption, acoustics, quality display, pretty good pictures for Facebook and less games and apps. So we're going to focus on Facebooking, watching movies and listening to music because that's the core of the phone, anything else will feel out of place and will maybe annoy you with the lag. This is the Orange Dive 71 review at gsn1.com. Hope you like the presentation, it's a youthful entry level phone focused on music, display and battery. Also pretty good camera for pictures. This is it from us, bye bye.